I'm Kathy Wren at AAAS, the nonprofit science society that publishes the journal Science. I'm talking today with Dr. Craig Venter of the J. Craig Venter Institute, whose research team has developed the first cell controlled by a synthetic genome. Dr. Venter and his colleagues are reporting their results in science this week. Dr. Venter, how long have you been working toward this goal, and what were some of the most important milestones along the way? Well, this has been about a 15-year process. It started back in 1995 when we sequenced the first two genomes in history, uh, including the smallest genome, that of Mycoplasma genitalium. And we set out a goal to try and understand what the smallest uh, genome you could have as an operating system to try and understand the basic components of life. It's taken us through this uh, long journey, much longer than we ever anticipated. Uh, but that's what happens when you enter into areas that nobody's ever been before. So we're, first we had to learn how to write the genetic code to synthesize pieces. Because the largest piece that ever has been synthesized other than our work has been only uh, 30,000 letters. Uh, the first chromosome we were trying to make was over 500,000. And the one that we ultimately made and reported in this paper is over one million letters of genetic code. And we start with four bottles of chemicals and the computer code uh, in the computer, uh, the digital code in the computer uh, from DNA sequence. So just learning how to do the synthesis was mastering a lot of chemistry that has never been done before. And we learned sequentially over the years how to build larger and larger molecules. Uh, in 2003, we reported uh, making a 5,000-letter bacterial virus, uh, Phi X174, and how to error correct the pieces. So we start with uh, pieces of DNA uh, coming off DNA synthesizers. They're only about uh, 50 to 80 letters long. That's pretty much the limit of what you can make uh, with a chemical synthesizer. So everything we make from that has to be putting these little pieces together much like having a, a, a box of Legos and having to assemble them uh, back in the right order uh, to get what you started with. So it's been progressive over this entire time period. Uh, we thought we would have this uh, almost three years ago, but uh, we kept running into very significant biological roadblocks. All right, and what do you ultimately hope to do with a method like this? Well, this is an important step, uh, we think, both uh, scientifically and philosophically. It certainly changed my views of definitions of life uh, and how life works. Uh, it's pretty stunning when you just replace the DNA software in a cell, and the cell instantly starts reading that new software, starts making a whole different set of proteins, and within a short while, all the characteristics of the first species disappear, and a new species emerges from this software uh, that controls that cell going forward. When we look at life forms, we see them as sort of fixed entities. But this shows, in fact, how dynamic they are, that they change from second to second, and that life is basically uh, a result of an information process, a software process. Our genetic code is our software, uh, and our cells are dynamically constantly reading that genetic code making new proteins. The proteins make the other cellular components, and that's what we see. But it's hard to imagine how dynamic it is until we found simply by replacing the software, it started making a whole new uh, cell, whatever is defined by that software. So that's, that's a pretty important change in how we approach and think about life. Uh, also, this is now the first time where we've started with information in the computer, built that software molecule, uh, now over a million letters of genetic code, put that into a recipient cell and had this process start where that information converted that cell into a new species. So this becomes a very powerful tool for trying to design what we want biology to do. Uh, we have a wide range of applications. Uh, so at the biotech company that funded this, Synthetic Genomics, that Ham Smith and I started a few years back. We have a major deal with ExxonMobil to try and use algae to capture carbon dioxide and make new hydrocarbons that can go into the Exxon refineries to try and replace taking oil out of the ground. There's no natural algaes that we know that can do this at the scale that's needed, 
So we're going to have to use our synthetic genomic techniques to either heavily modify existing algaes or develop whole new ones from scratch that have all the parameters that we want. These same tools, these same processes can be used for making chemicals, for making food substances, we hope for cleaning up water. Uh, but perhaps the most important uh, immediate application is uh, uh, we're already uh, working at the Venter Institute and working with Novartis to try and make uh, new vaccines very quickly. We think we can shorten the process by 99% uh, for making the flu vaccine each year uh, by using these new synthetic techniques. But I think it's going to be one of those situations I tell audiences I talk to that uh, we're entering a new era. We're limited mostly by our imaginations. Could you ever use a method like this with a higher organism, uh, something more complex than bacteria? Well, certainly not in the immediate future. Uh, bacteria have much more simplified genetic systems. They don't have the same complex regulation uh, that higher organisms have. But there are a number of single cell eukaryotes. So we're eukaryotes because we have a nucleus. And I think one of the key things we mastered with our studies, particularly since uh, 2003, uh, and we reported uh, the latest results uh, a few months ago in science at the end of last year, is we can move chromosomes across the branches of life. So we can move from bacteria into eukaryotes. We use yeast for all these processes. We can take the chromosomes out of yeast and move them back into bacteria to create new life forms. So a next step would be try to make a simplified uh, eukaryote. Uh, yeast is very key for biomanufacturing, for ethanol production, etc. cetera. Uh, and if we can have even a more efficient uh, yeast cell and at the same time try and understand all its components, I think we'll be able to make synthetic eukaryotes. Higher animals, multicellular systems are, I think, projects uh, for the much more distant future. Actually, I have a couple of questions just about how we distinguish between any sort of synthetically um, organisms with synthetic genomes versus the natural ones. Um, one question, I guess, would be about containment. In fact, we worried when we started down this process, what could be an artifact that could fool us into thinking we had created synthetic life when in fact it was just a contaminant of the native chromosome. And we were worried even a single molecule of native chromosome could fool us into thinking we had created a new cell. So uh, early on, we started designing the process of putting watermarks in the genetic code. Uh, we did this in the first chromosome we reported uh, two years ago. Uh, basically, all of us that helped build the genetic code signed the DNA uh, uh, coded our names into the uh, chromosome. Uh, with this genome, we've gone a little bit further. We've put four major watermarks in. Uh, we've developed a new code for writing uh, English language, other languages with punctuation and numbers into the genetic code. Uh, in the first watermark, we actually have this code that needs to be decoded for people to read the rest. Uh, we even have a website built into the genetic code that uh, if people solve it, uh, they can let us know that they've been able to read it. Uh, all the authors of uh, this study over the, certainly the last decade, her names are all encoded in this first uh, genome. Uh, and we have three quotations uh, uh, built in there of uh, adding a little philosophy to the genetic code at the same time. So I think the chance of finding any of these in a naturally occurring genome is uh, about as close to zero as you can get. So we can absolutely prove from the genetic changes that we've been built into the design of the chromosomes that it's unquestionably the synthetic DNA that we made, not some natural uh, contaminant. On containment, that's a really critical issue and it's one of the most important issues to us and one of the number one questions I get asked in all my, lit uh, all my lectures uh, around the globe uh, and when we look at molecular biology for the last several decades, we, we all use E. coli in the laboratory. The genes from multiple species have been put in it over the years, probably tens of millions of experiments. And there's not been a single accident. And the reason for that is that E. coli has a chemical dependency for growing in the laboratory. 
so these are things we can start to build into the design of synthetic genomes. We can build in suicide genes so they can't escape. Uh, and so we can use artificial amino acids. There's a number of approaches that we're developing and other labs are developing to guarantee absolute containment. In this first proof of principle, we've largely uh, copied uh, the mycoides uh, genome uh, because as a control, if we couldn't boot up something that was already known, we could never get to the design phase. We deleted uh, 14 uh, genes uh, from this genome and made all these other genetic modifications. Uh, this cell only grows on extremely rich media in the laboratory. Uh, the only other place it goes, uh, the mycoides uh, genome is a minor uh, goat pathogen uh, that causes mastitis in goats. Uh, we think we've eliminated the genes uh, associated with that uh, but it will not grow outside of the laboratory unless it's deliberately uh, uh, injected or sprayed into, uh, into a goat. So uh, we, we don't work with goats, so uh, we think we have pretty good containment systems in the lab. There are selectable markers. It's dependent on a specific antibiotic. Uh, so these are, these are early attempts. I think uh, these containment approaches will get far more sophisticated uh, with the next versions of what we and others do. All right. Well, are there any final points you'd like to make before we close? Well, this is the first synthetic cell that's been made, and, and we call it synthetic uh, because the cell is totally derived from a synthetic chromosome made from four bottles of chemicals on a chemical synthesizer, starting with information in the computer. Before we did these experiments, starting back, in the late 90s, uh, we asked for a complete bioethical review, uh, knowing we were going into uncharted territory trying to create new species. Uh, the review group, review group at the University of Pennsylvania uh, published their results in science in 1999. Since then, there's been lots of different re review uh, processes around the world. The Sloan Foundation funded uh, my institute, the Venture Institute, along with MIT, uh, in a Washington think tank to look at uh, the security issues concerning this. Uh, that report was published and can be downloaded from jcvi.org. There's been ongoing discussions in the U.S. government, in the EU, uh, the National Academy of Sciences has done reports on this. So I think this is the first incidence in science where the extensive uh, bioethical review took place before the experiments were done. And it's part of an ongoing process that we've been driving, uh, trying to make sure that the science proceeds in an ethical fashion, that we're being thoughtful about what we do, uh, and looking forward to the implications to the future. Well, thank you very much for talking with me today, Dr. Venter. Nice to talk to you.